Now I'm finally going to pivot to what you've been looking for all day, which is gene therapy. <laughs> okay, so um, could you tell us what you know about gene therapy, where we are so far, and uh, what we know about the ongoing studies? Yeah, so, so gene therapy, I'll, I'll start uh, sort of with just a broad um, sort of approach to how, how we do it. Um, and, and gene therapy addresses the issue that we discussed earlier with bone marrow transplant of not having a donor. The really interesting part with gene therapy is that the patient serves as their own donor. So this alleviates your issues with finding a donor, this alleviates your issue with uh, post-transplant graft versus host disease. So what happens essentially is, um, you know, stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells are taken out of a patient with sickle cell disease and then those stem cells are modified and then after some type of um, you know, a myeloablative uh, sort of regimen or some type of chemotherapy, those stem cells that have been modified either by gene addition, so the addition of a normal beta globin gene, or uh, gene editing, um, which uh, sort of introduces uh, a mutation that ameliorates the polymerization of sickle cells of, of hemoglobin S. Um, the, then once that, once that modification to stem cells happen, they get infused back into the patient. Um, you know, the, the data for uh, the Bluebird Bio Lentiglobin um, clinical trial uh, appears quite promising. Um, they have um, been updating us along the way um, uh, with a target, I believe, uh, a target of under 20 patients that they wanted enrolled. Um, I think they're, they're quickly approaching that, that target of patient uh, number. Um, they have shown the ability to um, generate a very clear, um, uh, a very clear signal from the inserted normal but tagged beta globin gene. Um, they've been able to show as as high as uh, almost a 50% reduction in um, sickle hemoglobin that's being expressed. So, gene therapy is the thing that that is sort of taking up all our time, right? If you go to any of our specialty conferences, managed care conferences, and even the disease-specific conferences, you know, there, there's the hope and promise of gene therapy and the, my God, what are we going to do about the cost and how are we going to finance this controversy, right? So, so where do you see the roadblocks to therapy and how do you see us overcoming those? And that's to both of you. Well, I think the first is the durability. So back to the outcomes. I mean, this is truly innovative. It's new. Um, and so promising, uh, but yet there's some uncertainty around, you know, clinical trials, a year, two years, how much data are we going to have at launch that may lead so, to some uncertainty around the durability piece. And certainly exciting if the durability is there, all these downstream costs go away, if you will. Uh, the hospitalizations, the end organ damage, the vaso-occlusive crises. Oh, my goodness, this is the cure we're all um, wanting to see. Um, so ensuring, and I think there's a lot of dialogue around um, models that hopefully support accountability around the outcomes so that we, we're paying for value. Um, I think the other issue is uh, guidelines, right? Guidelines that help to stratify, and especially with additional options, who does get what? Um, and so the need, I think, for a more structured approach so that even from an informed standpoint, patients share decision-making, caregiver decision-making, who are these patients that can benefit the most from these very innovative and very new, new treatments? I think very similarly, we would look at the, one, they're game changers. They're, they're going to potentially offer a cure to a disease that before now really didn't have many treatment options but they're gonna come at a heavy price tag. And I think manufacturers are interested in talking about a value-based or an outcomes-based contract. So you hold them accountable, accountable to the clinical studies that they promised the result. But can you, not to be difficult, but can you do that with the level of churn you have and some of these outcomes might be years down the road? Well, that, that will be the challenge because a lot of times you're following the patient for five years out. Um, we're, we're exploring that opportunity with a vendor right now. 
that would actually monitor that patient or watch that patient for five years out. The, the, there are some manufacturers are looking at milestone payments mm -hmm. that each year over a course of time you're making a payment based on an outcome during that year. That's difficult in, a, in our Medicaid program because they may not always be on your Medicaid roll. And so how do you make a payment whenever that patient is not yours any longer? So uh, Amar, as a clinician, you know, looking, looking at this, your focus is obviously the promise of this, right? And what it can do for your patients, what it can do for the disease state, and, and, and therefore how you practice medicine. You know, what's, what's, what's your, your take, take on this? You know, as far as gene therapy goes, I, I, I agree with these guys. There is just, um, this is so new to the game. We, we really don't, um, we don't have a good handle on exactly what we're, what we're dealing with, what the um, long-standing effects are, um, how, um, how long this will maintain. Um, and I'll tell you, on the, on the patient side, there's, uh, there's a lot of buzz about gene therapy. There's a lot of whispers on social media about gene therapy. Um, and, and, and we can't forget that part of the gene therapy um, at this point still requires conditioning with chemotherapy. And, and that, that gives a lot of patients pause. Um, they're un this is the same reason that they've been uncomfortable with hydroxyurea, is that hydroxyurea has been listed as a chemotherapeutic agent. Um, well, if you're going to use busulfan as a you know, uh, myeloablative agent, uh, patients are going to have the same, the same hesitation. Um, so while I'm excited, it's, it's, it's uh, cautioned um, optimism as far as gene therapy goes at this point. Yeah, so, so I mean, there's, there's a, a, a tremendous amount of discussion where to come on this uh, on both sides. But one of the things that I, having been a, a practicing clinician and then gone over to uh, uh, the payer side uh, as well, is that uh, it's nice that everybody's kind of converging on the idea of promise but balance and how we're going to figure that out. And there, there's, there's less of the clash that we usually get with new therapy. It's the, it's the balance between cost and value, but also how do these new emerging therapies fit into the treatment guidelines? Because we've got to revamp those. Yep. You know what I mean? We're using, I think you said earlier, guidelines from, that were developed in 2014. Those, those are going to be thrown away and all these new emerging therapies have to find their place in those guidelines. Well, I have to say, this has been um, extremely informative. Um, we're getting to the point where we're wrapping up here, the discussion. And so what I'd like to do uh, is get uh, sort of some final parting thoughts uh, from each of our uh, panelists. I'll ask you to start, Maria. Sure. So uh, I always learn a lot from our, the thought leader. So I want to uh, thank Amar for being here. It certainly taught us a lot. But... I think as we think about what is the world looking like um, and as thinking about what the payer needs are, uh, best practices in terms of comprehensive care, what are clinicians lacking so that we are not duplicating but we're truly managing holistic care. Uh, and the focus on outcomes and data, I always say it starts and ends with data and certainly with the promise of gene therapy as well as these very promising treatments, especially as we bring them together. Um, not only the hope, but the uh, data that supports uh, how we're managing the disease, how we're improving indices of success like survival, as well as total resource use, including hospitalizations and ER visits and pain management. John? Absolutely. Um, I'm looking forward to the collaboration with the thought leaders, the treatment experts to determine what those treatment guidelines are and how these fit into place. I'm excited about this patient population that now are going to have treatment options that never existed before. Um, also, equally excited the providers now have new tools in their tool bag. Um, so we're looking to partner with that. Um, they usually support us or they're normally a support when we collaborate with them to make sure that we're maintaining access where appropriate and, and being able to offer something this patient community has not had. Come on, I'll let you finish up. Well, it's been, it's been a long road from 1910. Um, it's been a long, dark road that has been uh, quite lonesome from the provider side where we really haven't had much going on in sickle cell disease. And finally, we're at a point where um, we're really gonna put a flag on the map in the next decade or two on how this disease um, is managed. Um, so we're fortunate to be um, supported by individuals like my colleagues on this panel today that uh, help us uh, make sure that we stay reined in and focused on the mission 
in an um, economically viable way. Um, but I am just so full of optimism at this point that um, you know, we, we are heading towards a future where sickle cell disease patients are no longer invisible. Thank you all for your contributions to this discussion. On behalf of our panel, we thank you for joining us, and we hope you found this panel discussion to be useful and informative.